Hello, today we are going to start with our series on trusses. This first video is going to be just a brief overview of the different truss types and what their names are and the jobs they do. We'll touch a little bit on the construction methods, but that will be dealt with mostly in a later video. All right, let's start with a basic truss. So here is a very simple truss and we're going to look at some of the uh, main features. So across the bottom here is our bottom cord. The job of that bottom cord is to take our sealing sheets. Our sealing gets attached underneath, possibly on battens or in some cases straight to the truss. And of course these angled ones down either side are our top cords that our roof battens and roof cladding gets attached to. So these pieces in the middle are the webs or the struts. Now when these get joined together, the truss manufacturer will attach nail plates to connect all these together. And the concept that these work on is the concept of triangles. Triangle is a very strong shape. It's a structurally sound shape. So when you look at this big triangle made between the top and bottom cords, the apex of these top cords form a fixed point. So these two webs that come down off that top apex are under tension. They are actually hanging off that top point and they connect to the bottom cord. So this bottom cord is hanging off those first two webs at that point. So these first two from the apex are under tension and they're preventing this bottom cord from sagging under weight. So now because that's connected to there, this becomes a fixed point, which means we can put another web in here to hold up the middle of the top cord. So because this is a fixed point, this web is now under compression. So this is pushing up the top cord nice and straight. And of course on a larger truss you would have more webs, but always the ones that start at the apex are under tension, then compression, and if it's big enough, tension, compression, and so on, until the webs run out. The other thing to look at is the locations where they connect. You can see this connection here and that connection there are pretty close to evenly spaced across the width of that truss. So the distance from that connection to that is about the same to that one and the same to that one. So you'll see we've got three fairly even spans across there. And where this connects up to the top cord, that one is pretty well halfway in between the length of that. And you'll find when you look at a standard truss which is built in that configuration, all of these connections are evenly spaced along either the bottom or the top cord, depending where they connect. Okay, so that is a brief overview of basic truss theory. That's just a standard truss. Let's have a look at how all the different types of trusses work into our wall frame. So here's a basic wall frame, a basic L-shaped house that we're going to be building our trusses on. If we notice, there's a bit of a difference between this wall frame from when we used this to look at our pitched roofing, and that is that the outside wall is sitting taller than the inside walls. That's because most of the time with the truss roof, the external wall is the only load-bearing walls. Usually the internal ones are non-load-bearing. Of course there are exceptions to that, but today we're going to keep things pretty simple. This is just going to be a standard run-of-the-mill house with external load-bearing walls and internal non-load-bearing. So we've got a second ribbon plate going around the outside walls. Now before we start building some trusses, we're going to have a quick overview of the sections of roof. When you're hand pitching a roof, all the components go in individually, but with a trust roof they have to go in in sections. So let's have a look at the main sections. And for an L-shaped house, there are three sections we've got to worry about. First section goes straight through here. And it's built basically as if it were its own individual roof. We don't need to build a corner into it. We just build that section first. The next section is the smaller span that's going to be going out on this side again built as a separate individual roof and then the third section is the bit that combines the two it gets built over the top of this first section so that it can create one roof all the way through 
And that's basically how truss roofs get built. They get built in sections. So this roof that we're going to build in, we're actually going to build this section first. And the reason is, if I pull that away and show you this first section here, where these trusses come down here, they need something to sit on. But there is no wall plate there to sit on. So there's nothing that can hold up that section of roof. So what we're going to do instead, we're going to build this section of roof first, because that will give us something to connect to along there. So that's the first section we're going to build. So let's come over here, and we're going to start by throwing up our standard trusses through here. These have been put in at 600 centres. That's just the spacing that I'm using. That's fairly common among trust roofs. This first spacing back here has been given to me by my set of plans from the trust roof manufacturer. That's not a distance that I make up. The manufacturer of the trusses will always give me a distance to either the first or the second truss. There will be a measurement specified on the plans. So I've positioned my first truss, gone 600 spacings from then. Now I'm going to put in the truss that will support the next section of roof. And that is called the girder truss. For the most part, it looks pretty well the same as a standard truss, but you'll notice this bottom cord is quite a bit taller than the bottom cords in the standard truss. And you'll probably find there will be some joist hangers mounted to the side of that all the way down for the other trusses to feed into. I just haven't drawn them because it was going to take too long. And a straight roof or a straight gable roof is really that simple, just a series of standard trusses all in a row. They of course will be braced across the top cords, but that will be something that we'll deal with later in your course. Let's have a look at this overhang. We've got a gable end to build out on this overhang. The last truss that we're going to put on the end is called a raking truss, or sometimes it's called a step-down truss. Step-down because it is just stepped down a little bit shorter than the standard trusses in behind it. You'll see there's no overhang because it's that much lower. And the reason that needs to be lower is so that our outriggers can come over the top of that raking truss, and that supports the middle of those outriggers, and it gives us something to mount our barge rafter onto. Some people call it a verge rafter, I call it a barge rafter, because it holds up the barge board or the fascia that gets nailed on over the front. So there is our simple straight roof with a barge end. So now it is time to do the next section of roof. So let's come over here. Now I mentioned before we always have a measurement on our plans from the corner back to our either first truss or one of the main trusses back here. And today that is going to give us the measurement to our truncated truss. Over on this end, there they are connecting into the side of that girder truss, just there. And these truncated trusses are called that, obviously, because they're a little bit cut off on the top. And that's to fit our hip rafters in. So there's our hips going up the corner, and that's formed that hip shape. Some manufacturers will actually make these as hip trusses, which are a slightly different shape, but they do the same job. So depending on the manufacturer, either a hip truss or a hip rafter. And once those hips are in, we can just follow through with the rest of our creepers. And there they are through there. They just nail to the hip rafter, making sure, of course, that when they get nailed on, your hip rafter is nice and straight up through there. Usually we run a string line or we get someone to sight it as we're nailing them on. So there we are. We've got our truncated up. We've got our hips and our creepers up. We have now formed a self-bracing hip end. We can now run a stick of timber over and use that to hold up our standard trusses through this major part of the roof, through there. Now you'll notice something is missing here. All of these bottom cords through here are there to take the ceiling, but we don't have any bottom cords in here. We need to fill the ceiling out. So we have to throw in a 
couple of ceiling joists in that end. Let's just have a look at this end. There's our ceiling joist going through there. Now there's nothing actually holding that ceiling joist up through the middle. All of these bottom cords are held up by these webs that are coming down. These truncated truss would normally have webs too. I've just left them out to make the drawing slightly less cluttered. But there's no webs holding that ceiling joist up. So we need to throw in a hanging beam. Here's a hanging beam which sits on the wall plate and sits on the next truss back. And it gives us something to nail the middle of that ceiling joist to. Sometimes these are referred to as ICJs, intermediate ceiling joists. So there's our ceiling joist in. And of course, just like a normal pitched roof, we would fill out the rest of the ceiling along the edge of the hip here with our trimmers. And that will give us something to nail all our ceiling to right up into the end walls. All right, so that is the second section done. The last thing to do is to fill in the connecting section of roof through here. And that is in this location here. We just run out a string line, make sure it's nice and straight, and throw in these trusses, which are called saddle trusses. They just sit on top of this major section of roof in a nice straight line with that part of the roof looking straight through there, nice and straight through there. And once they are in, this hip that's in through here just disappears underneath the roof battens. In fact, let's throw a few roof battens in just to see how they go straight across that section to form a nice straight piece of roof. And there we are. That is the most common types of trusses that will go into a roof. We've got our standard trusses that go through the main sections. We have our girder truss whose job it is to hold up other trusses that connect into it. We've got our truncated trusses that just sit underneath hip ends in there. And in fact, on some jobs, you can even have truncated girder trusses, which do both of those jobs, depending on the format of your roof. On our gable ends, we have our raking truss, which sits in underneath the outriggers. And our barge rafter or some people refer to these as our fly rafters on the outside end of our gable ends. Now there's one more piece of timber that I want to show you and it's not a truss it's just a length of timber and it's called the binder and that goes through the middle here. So let's get rid of some of these trusses so we can see it properly. So we can see here this binder, it just sits on top of our bottom cords all the way along, connecting all the bottom cords up to stop them from wobbling around and keeping them straight. But you'll notice that if we have a look at the two hanging beams and the binder, they effectively connect from one wall all the way through the bottom cords to the opposite wall. And that's a continuous line of connection that goes through there. Let's just quickly throw a couple of those trusses back in. There they are just running along the bottom cords just like that nailed into each one keeping all the bottom cords straight with a continuous connection all the way through. You might think well we don't have a connection all the way through there but we actually do. Let's put back in the girder truss so we can see here this wall frame has a couple of blocks connected to it so that we can nail the binder to it. That binder is connected to the girder truss, and then the girder truss has the truncated trusses connecting from there to the opposite wall frame. So you can see we do have a continuous connection through the truss, through the girder, and through the binder to the opposite wall. So there are all our trusses in. There will be a video a little later on in your course which will actually go through the method of standing these up and the methods of construction and also covering some of the legal requirements around truss roofs.